Hello and welcome to another Market Muse content strategy webinar in our series. I'm Jeff Coyle, the co-founder and chief strategy officer for Market Muse. And today's discussion is something that if you're putting content on websites, you have to care about. Um, so I'm also so excited to be joined by my guest, which I'm going to tease for a minute. The title of today's webinar is Does AI EEAT uh, or Does AI Eat uh, Maximizing Productivity Without Sacrificing Authority? And I think this is the topic that is on everyone's minds, thinking about how can we integrate AI in a business responsible way. So introducing uh, my guest today, the head of growth marketing, Nicole McLean. She's joining us from Composely, a company who is focused on high quality content um, and delivering services that are differentiated. How did you get to Composely? Uh, what's been that journey and what's your mission now at Composely as growth marketing? Yeah. Well, hi, everyone. So great to join you. Thank you to Jeff and the whole Market Muse team for having me on. Really excited for our discussion today. But yeah, so not, you know, not going back to the day I was born, but I was very fortunate to have a great high school teacher who dra drug me to my guidance counselor and forced me to take a marketing class my second semester senior year. And since then, I've just been in love with all things marketing. So started at a company in Indianapolis, um, exited for with 15.5. So we were in the HR employee engagement space. Mm -hmm. Got a really great foundation on startup, tech, growth, all of that great stuff, um, as well as what it means to lead and, and manage, which is just a personal goal and kind of personal mission for me. Um, then moved to government tech, because why not, which is the complete opposite. Um, have such a heart for that, but really kind of went back to the foundations. You know, there's not a lot of fanciness. There's not a lot of marketers who bring brand into the space like that. And so it was really cool to see how just the smallest things have the biggest impact. I think it was a really good reminder of how foundations work, which kind of leads us to today. Um, you know, came to Composely and when you're in an economic decline, it's foundational work and ingenuity that I think can really set you apart. So that is kind of our focus right now, making sure that we are operating as a marketing team with operational excellence taking good calculated risks and trying to be the most human person on the market, which transitions us really well to this conversation about AI. Um, but I think people want to do business with people. And so not forgetting that even though you send an email to thousands of people and they can seem like a number, it is a person on the other side of that that has the same fears, concerns that you do. And so I think just being a person makes a huge difference. You hope it's a person. You expect That's it's true. a person. Um, but just as a little bit of housekeeping too, um, and ask us anything. Now you just got Nicole's background. Um, lots of questions. Uh, bring them up. Um, you'll get the re replay in the next uh, few days via email. Please share it. Um, put it on your social if you think it's an interesting thing. And while you're at it, go check out our webinar library. Um, there's over 100 webinar recordings from amazing people like Nick Eubanks, Andy Crestadina, um, Pam Didner uh, on sales enablement. Um, there's just a wealth of folks who are talking about content, probably ones that align specifically with the project you're working on. So go check those out. Um, back to our discussion though with, with Composely and with your role, growth marketing. Growth marketing can mean person we just throw in there and they do everything marketing, right? And they, they, you know we're focused on growth because what marketing person really isn't focused on growth because it's online. Um, how do you manage kind of omni-channel marketing? You're on a webinar right now, uh, right? How do you manage understanding each of those channels? Which ones are most worthy of your time, your budget, your resources, which are, you know, obviously for everybody very constrained right now? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I would definitely say that my growth probably means a little bit of you manage everything, but if you're not driving that revenue at the end of the day, that's what you're ultimately held to. I think I have been fortunate that I've run a lot of things in the past. I've done webinars in all of my past roles, events, partnerships, social, digital. So have a, a good gut sense of what's worked and what hasn't. I think the biggest thing though is having data. So 
one of the first projects when I started Composely. I've been with Composely just under a year, mm -hmm. but pretty much the first three months was about getting our RevOps foundation in place, making sure that we knew where contacts were coming from, had a good understanding of how it moved through the funnel, understanding those really basic kind of revenue metrics. So what's our lead to meeting rate, meet, meeting to opportunity rate, meeting you know, opportunity to close rate, really staying close to the sales team on that. I think that's sometimes where that growth comes in is it's not just about the marketing metrics, but what are the sales metrics? And so then looking at each channel, but then oftentimes it's very infrequently, is it one channel that's actually converting someone? So trying to do some analysis and let's be honest, all of the CRMs that say that they can do that for you, they really can't. You kind of have to roll up your sleeves and, and go into pivot tables and do it yourself sometimes. But looking at your, your customers and saying, okay, hey, every single one of our customers go to at least three webinars that we host. We, that's why we do these twice a month so that our prospects have a chance to hit that three as quickly as possible. Oh, let's go pull a list of people who have only gone to one webinar and see if we can send them a replay or get them to the next one. And so I think looking at that data and figuring out how all the pieces come together is really important. But then ultimately, you mentioned when resources are tight, how can you repurpose as much as possible? So do this great webinar, get experts on, get them to give you their expertise, give them your tips, then use this and create a blog, use this and create social posts, use this and create clips that you can give to your sales team to send to opportunities and get really smart about the things that you, where you put your effort to create the most authority, expertise, trustworthiness, and then repurpose as much as you can. You're, you're playing um, two of my favorite words in one sentence games right now with me because repurposing and pivot tables are very commonly <laughs> stuff that I'm talking about. So I love that. And you even, you even segued it back to EA, EAAT. All right. So let, let, me, let me talk about EAT. Um, so if you're not familiar with what we mean by this, it currently stands for expertise, uh, uh, experience, expertise, authoritativeness, or authority and trust, right? It was at one point just expertise, authority, and trust, right? Then we added experience. There's a lot of speculation as to why experience was added, right? And this is a framework that Google has provided to the world to say, here are the things that really matter from the perspective of content quality comprehensiveness. Um, it's an evaluation process, it's an evaluation kind of uh, a rubric, one might say. Um, and so I'm going to just toss this out there for you. I would love your take on it is why experience was added. Is it, was it correlated to artificial intelligence and predicting that AI was coming? Or there's also a, a flight of humans who would say, no, it was already on the uh, already on the roadmap and it just got accelerated. Um, and the product reviews updates of the last few years are exhibition that of that. Whereas if you had a product reviews, a product review on your site and it, you clearly didn't taste all those dog foods, um, you're not showing that you actually had that experience and might run into problems. How do you take on, why did that additional E get added? What's your take on it? Um, does that even matter to what you're doing and the way that you're thinking about it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, when it first came out too, I feel like I even made this mistake. I had have this conversation with our SEO manager is that if they already have expertise, what's the difference between experience and expertise? And is experience the on-page experience or is it the experience of the author or of the brand that they're doing it? So I like to just do both because both are important, you know, um, that's probably not Google certified, but I love Me that too. answer. That's a really good answer. Okay, keep going, keep going. Yeah. Um, so on, on like my, so really me, there's three E's, but on the experience of on page, it's, you know, are you writing it so it's easily consumable? Are you answering the question up front? All four of these, in my opinion, is getting to helpfulness. Like that is still the core of Google wants to provide the most helpful content. And really, I know we're going to talk about this AI chat sheet. GPT, I think is trying to do the same thing. It's just instead of providing links, ChatGPT is trying to take it to the next level. Do they always take it to the next level correctly? We'll talk about that. 
but it is trying to save you time and provide helpfulness. And so are you answering that question or answering the intent of the query up front? So I do think that experience on page and how you consume the content is important. But I think there's a really interesting nuance between expertise, which is, you know, I'll be honest, we, we vet writers. That is the core of what we do. I think it is a core competency of Composely is that we've learned how to vet and kind of really get to writers who actually know what they're talking about or can kind of BS it through an application. But just because you have expertise in it, you could, you know, for instance, I spent five years in the HR world. It is one of the things that I feel very comfortable talking about. I spent a lot of time working with HR, creating content as a marketer for HR, doing webinars like this in HR. I've never been an HR leader. I've never processed payroll. I've never had to sit through a performance review as an HR person. So while I have expertise in that topic, I've never had firsthand experience in HR. And I do think there is this weird nuance that, to answer your question, I do think is going to become more interesting with AI on do you actually know this? You know, have you, have you been a paralegal or have you just written in legal for many years? You can still write great content and never be a paralegal, but are you truly a subject matter expert and can really suss out the nuance of fake you know, don't want to jump too far ahead in some of the things we're talking about, but some of the hallucination that AI might give you if I if you've never been a paralegal and actually had to sift through amicus briefs and stuff like that, you may not. And I think that is nuance, but it's nuance for a reason. So I can't leave we're gonna we're get to AI and large language models. I know that's all very exciting, but I think that we really, really need to focus on what you said, and I think it's it's, it's very tight. We're not gonna get into helpfulness yet. However, how you vet writers, everybody needs to know this. Everybody needs to know how to vet a writer. And one of the reasons you give is a forgotten reason. I've been in the seat and I've done that is very, very different than being a great journalist with journalism skills, the ability to extract that information in an authentic way. So been in the seat is different than journalism is different from adjacent experience. Oftentimes, those three things are being conflated. How do you make sure that those three things don't get conflated? And then I've got a follow-up question, which I'll ask um, that relates to, how do you make sure that it's the right type of content that you have experience on, right? So how do you make sure that that authentic, I've been in the seat, I've, I've, I've processed a payroll on that software platform versus yeah. I am, a, I've worked in HR for a couple of years versus I'm a great journalist, I'm a great researcher. What, what's the diff? Well, sometimes when you've been in HR, you know how to pull payroll, you're a crap writer. Like, <laughs> right. I grammar is not my, I work for a writing company, so I have friends and stuff who are like, oh, you work for a writing company, you can edit this for me. It's mm -hmm. like, I can edit for messaging and getting your tone across, but I did not, you know, I'm not an editor which is also another nuanced thing. I'm not gonna go in and say, yes, this is AP style. This should be hyphenated. This is a wrong use of a comma. Not my skill set because I don't, have ex I don't have expertise really or experience in it because I have great people who know that instead. And so it really has to be this great balance between someone, especially, you know, we're talking about SEO. If you are writing to lawyers or HR, if you were someone in, in payroll, you don't understand SEO, you don't know some of the best practices. And so if you ask that person to create that piece from scratch for you, you still have to go in and add in all of your expertise and experience, which is how to write a really good article that ranks and is helpful. And so it's figuring out the balance, which you know we didn't necessarily talk about this in prep, but is ultimately project management mm -hmm. and, and the workflow of the person who knows the type of content and then finding someone to fill the gap if they don't have that expertise. Maybe it's a video, maybe it's a quote, maybe it's an SME review. You know, there are a lot of really creative ways. Maybe it's a podcast or a webinar and you can link to that at the end of the page that says, if you want more info on it, go check out this podcast I did with this HR person. And here is a takeaway that relates to the blog I'm writing. 
there's so many interesting ways to pull that in. But I think that's the difference is if you've never sat in the seat, it, but you ask that for like, I remember in my last role was GovTech, specifically very niche. If anyone knows like what happened with lead water in Flint, Michigan, we were focused on sampling lead in water across the country. That's a very niche thing. <laughs> right. Absolutely had to have SMEs because I've never put a pipe in the ground as the head of marketing. I've never, I mean, I did when I started working there, I actually did go through and sample my water, which was fascinating, but I needed to rely on SMEs, but those SMEs had never worked in tech, never really had a marketer before, or let alone a marketing team. Um, the pace at which we worked and the pace at which they worked was very different. And so then it really came down to having operational excellence within our marketing function and knowing when to pull them in and making it as easy as possible for them to provide that subject matter expertise to us and then let the marketers know how to put that in and put the fun branding on it or put the, the campaign into place. So, I mean, so, and, and by the way, this is exactly what we talked about. We're just coming at it from a different layer because yeah. we're talking about, we have to be productive, right? And we can't sacrifice authority. And if you imagine how, what, what Google's doing is they're going from T to E with their history, right? They, uh, the original technology was evaluating trust as meaning links, right? And then they were saying, we're going to calculate authoritativeness with a combination of site or site section topic combinations. So is it likely that this section of the site will cover this topic? If they do cover this topic and we believe that they will, that it is a good idea that they should, right? Then we're going to attribute authoritativeness. Then you get expertise. That's the evaluation of quality and comprehensiveness. And is it amongst a, a vector space of or a blob of content that tells the story that you are an expert? Now we're going into experience. And while I wish it was only about UX these days, but it also includes, are you communicating a in a way that clearly shows that you did the thing or that you journalistically or as a writer appropriately represent authenticity, right? Mm -hmm. It may not be your personal story, but you might be telling someone else's personal story, but you're doing it in a legitimate possible way. So the way that you describe it, it's almost like a, a triangle of journalist researcher, it's expert, and it's person that can put that into a beautiful package and write it and turn it into a narrative. If yeah. you if you happen to be all three parts of that triangle, aren't you like the magician right now and and magical, even without artificial intelligence? Yeah, I would say there's it may squares are less fun than triangles, but then it's also the you can have the best content, but can you get found? And what hit me about what you said is part of where I think we started with T and then keep having having to add letters on is because everyone keeps trying to hack the process. I remember when I was entering the workforce and I was talking to an SEO agency that if anyone knows um, digital relevance, they were slingshot SEO before, kind of big in the space, but everyone started doing spammy link building. And at one point, SEO was synonymous with, oh, you're just going to go into the comments of blogs and put a link back and it's body and, and it actually created untrustworthiness because instead of just producing really good content that people wanted to link to, we scammed the process. And kind of each time, and I kind of feel like SEOs had to crawl its way back from that of like, no, 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 we're not spammy link builders. We're just manipulating good content that can be found and easily read through an algorithm. Kind of like when you're building a resume. Unfortunately, someone could get an interview who's not as qualified, but if they know how to be read by an applicant tracking system and actually show up to the hiring manager, they might get the interview over someone that actually has better experience. It's the same kind of analogy. But I think what we're finding as we have new tools at our disposal and the algorithms get smarter is you can't, unfortunately, you can't scam this process. You actually have to create good content and you have to know what that means and have access to those people because it's starting to be that you can't, keep scamming it. We keep changing the goalpost when you do. Well, we can, right? 
Yeah, doesn't doesn't isn't the point of this conversation that the stakes are going to keep getting raised? So the more letters in this acronym, <laughs> the harder this is to do in an inauthentic way successfully, right? And so uh, you know, my, my take on this is you know working with somebody like Composely, who's so thoughtfully vetting writers, who's so thoughtfully considering, and I, and I have a question for the for you here is you're doing this such that the output is going to be authentic, right? That needs to be the business minimum, whether I'm working with AI or I'm not. The output, that thing you get at the end, needs to exhibit expertise, authoritativeness. It needs to, you know, through the way that it's structured and in its positioning in the software, uh, sorry, on the website, you know, flow appropriately. I'm needing my clusters of content. The mm -hmm. collections need to be in the right place so that it makes sense that I'm writing this in the first place. Um, and now with this experience side, it's authentic. And so my question would be, regardless of how I'm resourcing it, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do I make sure that, first of all, that I'm doing all the things that are going to keep productivity high and that it's legitimate without a human in the loop? Or is the answer there always needs to be a human in the loop? I think the answer is that there always needs to be a human in the loop, but depending on, you know, the core competencies of your marketing team or mm -hmm. the, the state of your business, where that human is involved might look a little bit different. You know, if you have an SEO on your team, but you don't have a content writer, mm -hmm. the, S the human aspect may look different. If you don't have an SEO, but you have an in-house writer that can just crank where the humans involved in the process might look different. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately it always goes back to the same thing is like, do you as a business, has your leadership team or you as a marketing team clearly defined like your perspective and where you have the opportunity to be authoritative? And then what we find all the time, and it's something we tend to just naturally create because if they don't have it, we are not as successful as a partner is a documented style guide. Everyone always documents their design. You know, what, what are your hex codes? What are your secondary and tertiary colors? But very few businesses really document the written side beyond we are pro Oxford comma or we are not pro Oxford comma. You know, really getting more niche in to what is our tone, which is different than our voice and what are the key value props and the key things we want woven in. If you don't know those things, whether you're working with AI or a third party person, or even an in-house writer, any of those three entities are gonna have to make it up. It's just who's gonna make it up better. So I think the biggest thing is if you take the human approach and really document that well up front as part of your process, now you can really kind of pull on any triggers and be in a better place for success, just kind of from the jump. Nice, no, so I love that. And so I'm, I'm thinking about this differently, and, I, and I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I will protect the protect the innocence and the names of this story, but the um, I had the opportunity of spending uh, some time with some uh, fellow founders in my mastermind group uh, recently, and I, I, I met a, a gentleman who, what I believe, had the highest productivity content process that I've ever seen, right? And made sure that everything had a regimented SOP for authenticity review, quality comprehensiveness, really putting SOPs in those reviews and ensuring that somebody who has that personal experience sees everything in that process, right? And it blew my mind. And what it, what it ended up coming to was I didn't really care how the article got written. And so when do we get to that point where the actual content itself, the baseline, that original draft, right? Where, or, you know, there are story spines out there. There are structures of content one can create. There's a five paragraph essay, you know, there's different <laughs> where you, one might say then that content that, that is written to those structures would be derivative, right? But right. how can we go to maximizing productivity with this baseline? And there's a great comment in that you're, you don't have to look at the questions. We, keep adapting to change, right? How do we keep adapting to change so that the painful manual keyword research that isn't good, that you're not doing a good job anyway, 
most right. of the time you're phoning it in or you're doing some sort of shortcut. Um, mm -hmm. Your, you know, your chicken scratch, you know, uh, writing on a, on a paper and pad, which, you know, I still do, um, isn't, really isn't, same. isn't great process. And how do you get to the point where my baseline does, it, it doesn't matter how I get to a baseline because I'm going to put the checks and balances in place so that journalistic excellence, expertise, mm -hmm. and personal narrative and experience are always going to make it to the end. So why does it matter how it's being constructed? How much can I get out the door that hits yeah. on my business's goals for tone, voice, and quality? Isn't that the biggest, isn't that the biggest story here, the how you adapt to change? No, uh, thank you for kind of sharing that too, because I think that really tees it up well. Mm -hmm. I think the unfortunate thing is we're figuring that out right now. Mm -hmm. You know, some people are going to say, oh, AI can get you that first draft and that needs to be your process. Go figure out how to get the best first draft possible. Some people are like, no, it could give you a great outline and could give some good keyword research. I mean, there, there's so you would get 20 people on this call and you're probably going to get 20 different suggestions of where it's at. Right. I think... That's not a great answer. So I think part of it too does how I've been thinking about it is a bit of like what industry are you in and kind of what are the stakes for getting it wrong? Elizabeth, when we were talking, like she and I have been talking a lot about this topic. Is oh, Elizabeth Irvine, Market Muse uh, marketing lead. So. I just assume everyone knows Elizabeth. Because no, she's but she, she oh. does so many dishes. You, you think growth marketing, she does every possible aspect of marketing and is an expert on on most. So yes, good person exactly. to be talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah, follow her on LinkedIn if you're not. But yeah, please. when she and I were talking about this, it's such, she brought up a great point of like you, think of a stair step of how to create the trust and relationship with your customers or your prospects. And your everything you do, every piece of content you put out is an opportunity to build that and you do one wrong thing. I mean, let's look at Twitter. Like, let's look at Netflix who did tried to do love is blind live reunion and failed and was just getting roasted. Like I said, okay, fine. I can't watch the reunion, but I'm being very entertained by the tweets. Like blockbuster is <laughs> coming back out and just annihilating you. And everyone's like, you better not send me a price increase anytime soon. Like you better stop telling like, Stop telling us we can't share passwords because this one thing just made everyone super frustrated. So all of the good Netflix has done just completely erased overnight. And so I think the risk of using, a, I mean, I'll be honest, like we have people who come to us and are like, we want to pay one cent a word for our content. Okay, fine. It's not like if you can figure out how to do that and it's good, more power to you yet to see someone who's able to do that without pouring hours into editing that content, but you do you. AI, whatever that looks like, if it's wrong and you don't have someone who's an expert who's reviewing it, or you are like, oh, I'm tired and you know, I'm trying to produce at scale and AI gave me this thing and I miss this source was hallucinated or I miss this wasn't right. And you're giving retirement advice, you're in like a your money, your life, um, medical, anything where the risk is so high, you, you, that time you've saved was at what cost? Right. You know, but like I market to marketers, it's not that deep. We kind of all know things like there's not, there, there are some very clear things where you're going to be able to pick up. Maybe uh, uh, an industry like that, AI could be a great tool. And that's maybe where we test first. I mean, I've said, we're, we're experimenting with this internally. And I've told our ops and R&D team, let us be your guinea pigs, because we're going to spend the time with our content to make, and guinea pigs is a little derogatory of this. But we're like, we will test this, and we will put the effort in, and we will make sure that nothing goes out that we are not 100% confident with. But we are doing that both for our marketing efforts and for our business. Not every marketer is going to do that. And you miss one thing. And to me, the risk is too high with as novel, but you have to, it, it does depend, I think on the industry and ultimately that, that yardstick. But I don't know. What do you think? I think a few rodents listen to this show and they're highly offended. Um, so <laughs> no, the, um, the authentic, so the conflation of authenticity, expertise, quality, 
and correctness. Mm -hmm. Those things are being conflated. By the way, search engines have to evaluate those things separately. Okay, if they if they have this challenging problem that we've helped create with this problem, we better expect the thing you mentioned with Netflix. I actually don't know that reference. I, I, I people were talking about it, but I don't know it from the inside. But I'll I'll equate it to um, yeah a popular publishing network who published an article uh, which had a personal narrative that wasn't true, um, and. Uh, they were reported by another publishing network and saying that person doesn't exist. And they reported it publicly and said, XYZ company uh, published this article and it doesn't exist, the blowback from that. Well, imagine Google will have to do that too. They were going to have to treat, and I like to say, as we go from T to A to E to E, you got to be, it's, le- it's, 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 it's less, it's more nuanced when you make that error. It's harder for them to find but they're gonna be way more punitive with those efforts because faking authenticity, you can't come, it's gonna be real hard to come back from that. You can come back, everybody can come back, but you you can be very, very hard to come back from faking authenticity. So you're gonna see people overreaching with audit trails on content um, and making sure you know, like this is, this content, you know, it went through this editorial process. We did use this technology, you know, so I think that that's what we're, that's where we're headed is comprehensive audit trails. And I think that everybody should be thinking about that, um, not faking it. Um, mm-hmm. And if you are faking it, you have to know the risk for yourself and you have to communicate that risk to your client. Um, so being a writing network though, you're vetting your writers. Do you draw the line? Are they able to use whatever they have access to? Are they able to you know, equivalently phone a friend and say, hey, I never, filled out HR forms in gusto, uh, but I have to write an article about it. Can you tell me everything you know? Right? Are they allowed to do that? Are they allowed to phone a friend that might be more of a computer? Right? <laughs> yeah, right. it's a good question. I mean, right now our terms, and you know, we've been asked by clients very explicitly, I do not want AI content. I do not want <laughs> using it, right. you know, and that is in our like T's and C's, like no AI content right now. Right now, you know, I think there is a, you do, again, you just have to be open and honest about it. Like I said, we're actively researching the best way to maybe use it as a first draft and then have those SMEs going through it. And what is that line? But we don't want to do it without testing, without really making sure like what you were proposing, what is that line and what is, what are people kind of comfortable with? But what we say is our writers will look at anything that's publicly available. You know, so through Google, like, you know, they're not going to go and survey five of their friends who are in HR and then cite that as a valid and credible source, but we'll look for those things and provide their sources. Right now, I trust humans to provide sources that are real more so than I do some of the hallucinations that have come up and been shown on AI. And I'm not negative to AI. Like there are some really cool things, but I do think the funniest thing, because I've yet to see AI do this well, is you know how they used to say like, Google yourself and kind of like from personal brand. And if you're trying to get a job, like go Google yourself, go ask ChatGPT to like write a bio for you mm-hmm. or to go do things. Cause I've seen one live example, we needed a bio for our CEO. And he's like, I don't really like mine. We are live on a call, pull up chat GPT. He gives the, him, gives it his LinkedIn profile and it is just making up many things. Um, I think it's probably pulling from like his interests or like the sidebar. He's like, I didn't go to this college. Did never lived in the state of this call. Like it was making up things. I was watching a couple videos, you know, in prep for this and someone said, you know, write an about page for me. like she was doing it and she's like okay well that's wrong I, I never wrote that didn't write that book that's not me and so i feel like it really has not done a great job of like creating that personal narrative with accuracy yet so the question so the question then becomes yeah you, you you've prefaced everything with yet and maybes um which i love um on these because it is it's, it's an ever-moving effort so Speaking well, to and on that, I'm so sorry, quick tangent, because I know we talked about this, but there was, I saw an article about 
like a game show or a podcast or a webinar or something, but they were had kids and they brought in actors and they brought in experts and they let the kids ask questions and go th through things and the kids had to guess who's the expert, who's the actor. They, every time, were guessing the actor as the expert because they weren't hedging their bets. They were just coming out with full confidence and the expert would always say like, typically in my experience, yet maybe kind of creating that, that nuance to things. And the kids viewed that as a sign of doubt or a sign of lack of confidence. And so the producers of the show or podcast or whatever had to tell the actors to be less confident. And I think that's just like very interesting as you think about how you suss out and like, how do you, how do you define what an, an SME is or what a thought leader is or like, what, what does an expert mean? What are the things that have to be in place there? And sometimes saying yet, or maybe means that you've seen it work, but a lot of times you haven't seen it work. So you, you have to give both sides. Well, in information retrieval or in content evaluation, you can also evaluate the uh, frequency of doubt, the frequency of statements of fact, right? Uh, instances of those things, um, typical structures of, of content. Um, there was a kind of a some early artificial intelligence platforms that were doing this, you know, five and six years ago, where it would analyze your content and identify situations where you might have floppy, floppy stuff being stated. And is it is it appropriate, right? Um, and, and, and that's where the, that, that nuance of authenticity and facts, well, you can hedge your bet against facts with a few modifiers. So is that going to be good? But then you look at it from someone who's reading that article and it's not a good experience. So I would say when you think about large language models and chat GPT, I think a lot of the kind of uh, the world is making the mistake of equating AI equals ChatGPT because it's the only thing they have access to for free. Like they got access to this thing and it's really cool. It does a lot of stuff, but it's not supposed to know the facts by its default, right? It's not supposed to do mad libs. It's not supposed to, um, you know, right. necessarily write your bio accurately. It's just, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a large language model that isn't refined for you. So why do you think, is it just because of the democratization of it? that people are, you know, it, could that cause blowback and, and mistrust of future AI? That is your question that the experience that we've had with chat GPT might cause people to not want it to be part of their it. processes, even though it mm -hmm. could provide a valuable part of their productivity. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it is going to go through kind of the natural like adoption curve that any new product or experience, I think this one is just there's so many ethical questions, which I think people are still figuring out. I don't know if we really want to touch that on this particular conversation, though it's fascinating. You know, there's the 60 minute interview or the 2020 interview with this, the CEO that's like, is this the downfall of society? He's mm -hmm. like, it might be. And they're like, if it is, should we keep pursuing this? Mm -hmm. Like there are some really big questions with this. So I think the adoption curve just is more present and feels heavier than, you know, a widget that you're trying to take to market. I think, you know, we talked about this too. I do think that just how you use it and therefore the quality of what you get back, the fact that it's called chat GPT, I feel like is, is one of the things that it is affecting how people use it and what they think they can get back. Honestly, more than, than this is the first tool. Because I think people go in and you call it a chat. And what it, I started this whole thing with like, you're a human and you're talking to humans. So you go to it, but really good prompts and how you get the best result is very clinical, is very, it's not chat language. It's not conversational. Like that can confuse it because it's not a human. You're not actually chatting with it. You're, I, I don't, telling it, asking for things like, and the chat I think is almost the thing that I think part of why they're developing so quickly and some of the, you know, rollouts and things that I've seen is because I think they, I don't know if they in anticipated how our behavior was going to adapt this. Like it would no, be that, interesting that makes, if it wasn't yeah. a chat. Like if it wasn't called chat and this was rolled out, how would we be using it differently? How would it be adopting into our day to day? And would the, the quality of the output be better? 
if we well, weren't thinking of it that way. I don't know. I mean, I'm a little, little, little no, the, the the answer to that question is that's ha that's what happened, right? So large language models have been around for many years. Um, you mm -hmm. know, MarketMuse had a, a, a platform, a GPT-2, GPT-3, GPT-3.5. Chat GPT is just an interface on top of those models that allows you to interact with them. But a lot of people's use cases are not chat responses, but they're interacting with it in that way. So there may, in many, what I'm finding mostly is that content teams and search teams are using chat interactions, but there's actually an AI platform that will do their task better. Right. And they just don't know about it. So the key is, I think we're in a place of people think that this is a one size fits all magic carpet, uh, but it actually only does a certain set of things. And so people are modifying it, trying to, you know, really massage it and make it better. And that's great. That's going to drive innovation. Um, so, I, but I'll, I want to take back, there's been some amazing questions and I want to pause before yeah, we go into our next discussion. Carl, awesome questions as always. Um, I love this question and I think the answer, my, I know what my answer is, but Nicole, I, I love yours coming, coming at it from a content agency effectively is, should every article or content, I'm, I'm expanding your question a little bit, Carl. Should every article or content item we create have a risk attached, attached to it? based on the way we build it or how we source it? Should there be a risk, a communicated risk on that brief? I'm like jumping so deep into the operational aspect like in my head, but I do think as a marketing leader, we make risk assessments all the time. I just think now we may not have experience on how to calculate the level of risk to it, but yeah, I mean, I think if you are not considering risk either because you're adding it to a content brief and creating a rubric that your team or company has agreed upon and you want to go that deep or you're gut checking like, yeah, let's let's try it or this is a test or whatever, you are making calculated risks every time whether you actually document it or not. Yes, I, I think that's that they, no, it's, it's, it's right. By the way, brilliant question. My, my head is exploding on this one. Um, the, I have a presentation and it's the true cost of content, right? It's opportunity cost. If you don't publish something that's good, it's how much did it actually cost? It's cost to maintain. But Carl, I never included risk, right? I never included into true risk. If we produce a low quality content item, it can destroy our entire site. If we produce an inauthentic quality, so I think that there's another. Well, it is the dimension, like, another great, dimension needed. Yeah. Don't, which I use all the time because people, I mean, it's the thing don't let great or don't let perfect stand in the way of good. Mm -hmm. But it's what does good mean? Mm -hmm. You know, like your good versus my good or your risk versus my risk is different. And I do think that's where you need to be having some of these conversations and making sure that. You know, depending on where you're at, if you're if you're a content manager, align with your VP. If you're the VP, align with your CEO. Just make sure everyone is on the same page because this risk might change. I mean, I we are currently developing a generative AI guide for a content marketer. Mm -hmm. And when we wrote the outline a week ago or two weeks ago, whatever, it very clearly was that Chat GPT only had access to September of 2021. So anything after that, it you either had to put in the page or, you know, you could get around it, but didn't have access. And then, like, last week, I saw on LinkedIn that now there's an internet plugin and it can have access to the internet. And it, so it's, it's already changed just in four days of approving an outline on this topic. It's changing so rapidly that I don't think you really can go in and be like, we're going to create a doctor and internally on what we're okay with. Cause as soon as you get everyone okay with that, it will have already changed. But just having right. I think, open communication is important. I love, I love that express the, the exhibition. I, I think, I think it's something that we have to put in a the, the potential benefit of a content item as part of a collection, right? A, a, tr a goal, a goal should be associated with it. And, the hard cost versus real cost, right? Um, and by the way, if if you if if you work at a company or any of your that associates the cost of content as one line item one time, call me. Uh, you're not even accounting for it in your finances and taxes properly. So call me if you are saying that content costs three hundred bucks 
and you're counting it as a $300 expense one time, you're wrong. So just call me. Um, but it, specifically, for fundamentally from a marketing perspective, I think there's some additional questions that I, I love it. I love that question. I think it could be a five it episode really series. Uh, it's a great idea. It's a great thought. Um, some other questions before we move on to a next topic is a uh, comment, great comment from uh, Danielle. Um, uh, AI is increasingly being used to make workplace and real world life decisions, but I believe humans remain vital. So I'm going to, I'm going to touch on that as I love the comment. I think humans remain vital as well, but I think that humans need to get dump some of their dogma and their historical hangups. One of them is you, how you make decisions, right? So oh, I think yeah. how, how did that dovetail into what Composely produces? How are how is the team that's producing content as a service? How are they making decisions differently? Yeah, wow, that's like such a big philosophical question. Yes. I think, I mean, I think how you're making decisions. It, I mean, even like the, like this, just the the conversation we were just having on risk. I had a very real conversation with our SEO manager because we're updating copy on our site and. Google views hyphenated words and non-hyphenated words as different keywords, but one of them is grammatically correct and one of them is not. One of them is easier to type into a chat, into a search field, and one of them is grammatically correct. We are a writing company. Mm -hmm. So do, you know, dis human decision. I can't ask anyone else to make that for me. We have to weigh, do we try to get more SEO juice by putting the keyword that has higher volume, which probably unsurprising to anyone, does not include the hyphen. Mm -hmm. Or as a writing company, do we make sure that we don't produce anything that has grammatical errors? What is the decision there and what is the risk to our brand? Like if someone right. comes to the website who probably isn't thinking about the hyphen and that, they're going to be like, oh, they're not hyphenating this anywhere. Do they actually know? Like, am I going to trust them with my content that they're going to produce grammatically correct content if their website can't even be grammatically correct, you know, and I'm just using this to illustrate like, yeah, I think it's a great illustration. And and so the narr the narrative, the communication, by the way, awesome questions. And I've got some other ones that we'll get into uh, from Carl as well. We'll connect them. Is, Carl has so many great questions. Carl has so many great questions today. Um, and always. Um, and the, what I will say is this is well trodden ground. But because content is both an art and a science and an exhibition of expertise, it's different than other business logic that is already extinct. So, for example, if in the 80s and 90s you evaluated your leads by saying uh, if it's from the United States and Canada and it's of a company that's 500 or more, it's good. If not, it's bad, right? By the way, if you still do that, that way of thinking is extinct, right? Grading leads predictively based on your CRM data, based on your churn data, based on all of that. Uh, your publisher, if you're a publisher, their frequency of becoming a subscription, their page views per user. You can connect that to thousands of different inputs and you can predict accurately. And what happens over time with a model like that is you become more confident in it. At first, you're skeptical. And then it's better and better. You have more repetition. And then you become confident in it, right? You become confident in that predictive lead score. It will turn into success for you, right? Do you forgive it when it makes a mistake every once in a while? Perhaps. Do you check it often? You start to learn to live by that model. And you continuously improve it. But because content has this meaningful thing it's just like an art object it's just like a photograph we're in we as humans are evaluating that so i don't think it's i think keeping human in the loop until it begins to learn through machine learning whether you're training the model to know more about you by the way you can train a language model with every article you've ever written you can train it with your personal narrative you can restrict it to only speak from your personal narrative all these things exist just because ChatGPT doesn't do it doesn't mean it's not true. So is it ready to make unsupervised decisions? It absolutely makes supervised decisions all the time. Does it need to be monitored? If you're using things off the shelf that aren't really specific, it certainly does. But 
you always need to assess the risks. So if I make a mistake, what's the stakes? What's the stakes of making the mistake? And I think that that's where, Nicole, you've made some really, really great points about the stakes are raising, you need to really make uh, an assessment of what that means because an early adopters could equate to early catastrophes. Isn't that fair? I think it's absolutely fair. Mm -hmm. And um, and you've given the uh, you've given us some some good examples of that. Um, so awesome! Another question uh, from Elizabeth. This is a real a real talk type situation, and it's happening all over the place. I've had conversations with people crying on the phone with me about similar topics to what Elizabeth asked. Um, I have a client that wants to replace me with AI generated content, um, but the best possible process that I can imagine using AI generated content would still mean that this content would take two to three hours of human labor to get out. And that's, you know, not going to provide that much additional value. What's the flaw to that? Uh, what's the flaw to maybe allocating only an hour of human expert time to clean this thing up? What's the flaw in that plan? Or is there no flaw of just having a human editor in the mix? with drafts generated from AI? Yeah, I think flaw is maybe not how I would look at it. I think fact checking, again, it goes back to, is the person who is editing it have both? Mm -hmm. Because if it's what you asked earlier, what happens if you have that person who's pulled payroll, but can they write? Are they going to, when they're editing, you know, delete semantically related keywords and have no idea. And now you've lost SEO juice or, (laughs) you know, which is so, which sounds like that's not the most important thing all the time, but sometimes if you don't know it, you know, it's like, Hey, you could have made that sound really good and woven that in, but you didn't realize that you needed to keep that in They rewrite this whole thing. And now someone has to go back in and and add the SEO to it. So now that's not just one hour. That's probably two hours of work. Mm -hmm. Um, and they may not be good writers. I mean, that's just a reality is they might have that expertise. We actually just released a case study. So I have some like data, I guess, on it, but we are working with a, an agency who creates content for multiple clients and they tried to do in-house writing and then also worked with some, like, I, I honestly don't know who, but competitors of Composely. And mm-hmm. what they found was when they moved to a, agents uh, partner like Composely, they didn't have to spend time vetting the writer, you know, managing them, making sure that all that process stuff, but they were spending an hour to two hours per piece editing because the quality wasn't good. It wasn't there. They had to, the amount of time to massage it. They worked with us and they were like, we cut editing down by at least half Yep. for every piece because the, the initial draft they got was just that much better. And so for this example like if you are a writer who has already learned their tone who already knows the nuances who has those relationships and can pepper in things you hear about a customer or a value prop of theirs like there is probably a lot of value in keeping that and maybe that editing goes down to 15 minutes because that first draft is so good or maybe she could you elizabeth experiment with ai as your first draft and you can get it there that much faster and maybe you can save them because that's the biggest thing right now that i think is a little unfortunate for everyone is i think we're asking ai to do so much because everyone's so terrified about the economy and everyone's looking for ways to keep which we always are we always want to be efficient but it's so top of mind right now i feel like it would be so interesting to have seen this launch during a period of economic growth versus this period of economic restraint where I think people are willing to take more risks without having to pay, you know, 20% more, 50% more to ensure that that risk isn't going to be taken. You know what I mean? Well, I think, and absolutely. I spend a lot of time thinking about what you just said. Um, and to Elizabeth's comment, content, if you are a payload generator, it's a hard place to be right now. It's a hard, if you were doing two Z, three Z cent content, um, you have to level up the quality of your services. And what does leveling up the quality of your services mean? That's, that's, that becomes almost like a product management or products as a service, service, you know, service products as a service challenge that every 
So, I mean, hate to say it, Nicole, but the problem is y'all have the problem. Elizabeth, you, that, your persona has this problem. And it's because you're typically not, you were typically potentially delivering payload versus specific content strategy and outcome value. So the question, I, the answer that I have is inspiring content strategy change. And because what I, what I think about it is, what are you doing more and better as a result of having this technology? A great example of this, and I use this example a lot was, and I'll keep the anecdote short because we're on time, is before Washington Post used MLG and Heliograph was their first technology, by the way, seven or eight years ago, I mean, I don't really know the number, maybe it was five, maybe it was seven, um, they were only able to cover, I think it was 10 to 15% of the Olympic events, right? Mm -hmm. Now they can cover all of them with this technology. So for your company, you're using this to potentially, you know, what are you doing? Are you writing more content for your industry specific target market now? Before you could only write generalist content. Now you're writing more in the biz stuff. You can hire industry experts to be your assistants. So I think everybody needs to reframe this. You're not, your likely end goal isn't the same amount of content just subsidized by AI. It should be more better. And I think that that can change the narrative. Um, if you're in a situation where someone's like, yo, I want to replace you with drafts because I was playing with this thing and it made a paragraph that was kind of readable. Um, I think changing that discussion to, well, last year you published 120 articles and only five of them get organic traffic right now. That's the problem we need to fix. Let's fix that problem. Let's, let's not do that you know, by just generating more content um, that's out of alignment. So awesome questions. Um, you have a, you have another, you had another thing that we were talking about that relates to subject matter experts in-house, or do we talk to the team? Do we find subject matter experts? Do we talk to your team to try to extract all that good stuff out of their brains? What's Composely's approach to this? And I think that that dovetails well with, um, another question that we got about workflows. Yeah. It's a good question. I mean, from my experience, it is very rare. It's kind of like the like the engineering unicorn to find mm -hmm. someone that you can hire in-house that can produce enough to warrant the salary that can keep up with business or can keep up with the the pace that the marketing team needs or oftentimes is like floating on an island, which never works and report like dotted line reports to the CEO and is trying to help product and sales and marketing. And whatever. so like it just the process of how to have an in-house SME can be really challenging um, or they are the SME because they're delivering. Like a lot of times I've seen really good thought leadership and, S and SME um, takeaways come from your delivery team on CS, mm -hmm. but you can never get to them because very few companies don't have their CSMs working at 110% capacity. And you're like, oh, but you're on the front lines and you're talking to our consumers and you actually know what's working and what's not working. But how do I get that out of your head? Because you have a full-time job. So right. there are real challenges on the in-house side. And the downside is sometimes your CSMs don't have the, like what we said, they have the um, experience but they don't have the credentials they haven't been in this industry for 30 years and so like they might not be posting on linkedin they might not have a digital presence that google's gonna say oh cool bob smith talks not about this for 40 hours a week but i he likes motocross like why would i make him an expert so there is this like weird challenge to, to figure that out and then sometimes you have your SMEs. I think there are a lot of them in marketing. I don't think you're one of them. I'm not just saying that because I'm on your webinar. But you have these SMEs that are like, oh yeah, well that's ten thousand dollars. Like if you want me to, you know, take ten minutes out of my day to do something for you, like it's a crazy amount of money, or it's very self-serving to them. Like how how is this that I'm doing for you going to make me better or whatever? Versus like, no, I just genuinely want to help you, or like. Yeah, I guarantee that if someone on this call is like, Jeff, we are line iteming 
content at $300. Can you help me? I'm sure you'd be like, yeah, let's hop on a call. I'd love to do that. Like, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm on that call. Just book it. And, and it's an awesome dovetail to, I've said dovetail too many times today. I got to work on that. But offer, um, book a demo with me, with a team member, uh, free, no strings attached. I mean, deep down, I really want you to buy Market Muse, right? I mean, I do. I do. However, that's not the transaction that happens on this personal content audit. And I will look at your site. I will learn everything there is to know about uh, guinea pigs and motocross <laughs> as part of this research effort, um, just so that we can have a meaningful discussion about right. this. Um, okay, so final thought, final question for you before I tell you where, uh, before I tell people where to find you is what's the next letter in E E A T? What's the next letter? Is this the gonna- game? We're gonna play. What, what's your next letter? And if anyone's still listening, what's the next letter on E E A T? What's the next one that's coming? Okay. Well, I have what I think should come. Okay. What is it? That's all I want to know. What is it? I think it is is going back to like human or like relationship. I'm trying to make that into a word in my head, like E. Awesome. Yeah. So so and the, uh, yeah R. Okay. So we're going R. I thought you were going to say user uh, UX or user experience because that was the, that was the one yeah. that I think like probably will come next that mm-hmm. they can actually measure with data mm-hmm. um, is probably a, an X, an X or a or another E for experience. Like the other side of experience is that how easy is it to get to your site? Do they want to spend time? What's the bounce rate? Cool. Well, I, I think there is going to be something related to commercial uh, commercial intent, um, and and it's going to be uh, uh, related to um, n- authenticity, uh, r- misrepresentation of commercial commercial intent, um, and I think we're going to see that. I love it. Okay, here we got. Okay, from 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 my from our amazing guests. Before we tell you to go find Nicole on LinkedIn, Nicole MacLean. Um, head of growth from Composely, uh, but we got connection. Love it from Angie Elizabeth. Creative, beautiful. Uh, Carl's got um, subject. Oh, relationships and human. Earth. E E A R T H. Awesome, Angie. I love yeah, she this. Did it. Uh, she home run that one. Um, I got subject matter jurisdiction. I like that one. I don't even know how to even go into that one. I don't. Maybe that wasn't the acronym. Um, but no, Earth is beautiful. Um, I, I saw a meet in there with the M E. Uh, so uh, beautiful. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. And Nicole, this has been super fun. Um, how can people get in hold of you other than LinkedIn um, if they want to learn more about Composely? Yeah, absolutely. You can reach out at Nicole at Composely. So N I C O L E at compose.ly. Um, if you have questions, very similar to Jeff, if I can hop on a call and be helpful in any way, would love to. If you disagreed with anything, help make me better. Would love to hear what you think. Um, or if you're interested in Composely, I'll get you connected to the right person, keep you out of any sales sequences uh, if you are interested. Ah, uh, those horrible sales sequences. We all do and... that. The data's there. But if you want to skip that, happy to help. Again, jump relationship. The, jump the line. Jump the line. And you can jump the line at Market Muse if you email me, jeff at marketmuse.com too. Um, and uh, it's been a pleasure, Nicole, as always, um, good, good, luck, good luck with the rest of the quarter and um, a number of events that you got on, 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 on the table. Um, you yeah, always are doing something in Atlanta, exciting. Email me. I'd love, I'm going to be there next week. Would love to meet up. Awesome. Atlanta next week. I know you have an event next Thursday night in yes. Atlanta, Georgia. Go check that awesome. out if you're in and around the area. All yeah. right. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's been so fun, Nicole, uh, as always. I'll t- and talk to you soon. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone.